Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of the Navigating History Podcast. I'm AJ. I'm going to be the host for this show. Um, and the way this this particular podcast is going to go is I'm going to get into exactly what the show is going to be about. And then I'm going to get into our first, uh, first episode here. So this show... It's called Navigating History, of course, is going to be about navigating through ancient history all the way through to medieval history, focusing mostly on military and political history, uh, which is my particular uh, area of focus and interest. But again, we'll we'll focus on pretty much everything throughout those time periods, including religion and politics and uh, the military history, including different battles, as well as I discussed. And uh, today we're going to start with one of... One of the wildest things that has ever happened uh, in my study of history, we're going to focus on uh, Alexander the Great's Balkan campaign, specifically starting with the Battle of the Granicus River in 334 BC. Now, why was this so important? You uh, you know, you may be asking if you're listening to this, you may think, okay, why, you know, Alexander the Great, yes, he was a great general. Why was this, why is this so critical? Why is this, why are you focusing on this battle? AJ, why are you focusing on this? And the reason for that is because without this, without what happened at this battle, if, th- if things had gone differently at the Battle of the Granicus River, Alexander the Great would never have been Alexander the Great. He would have been some plucky Macedonian king who died in like the first ever, uh, you know, conflict. He would never have been given the, uh, the title of Alexander the Great and you probably wouldn't even remember him uh, if you're studying history. You might go, okay, you know, you might pass over him the way that, you know, you do certain Roman emperors that we'll get into later on. Now, the way, um, before we before we get into the, the details of the battle itself, we need to do a little bit of background into sort of what was going on in Macedon at the time. Uh, and, you know, this, this was Alexander's first... I want to say international uh, or non-Greek uh, encounter uh, after the death of his father Philip II, and Philip II took Macedon from this tiny, almost, uh, almost backwater—not uh, necessarily backwater, but small uh, in influence uh, country in 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 Greece—and developed developed it into one of the. Uh, premier powers in in the region uh, despite its small size and obviously after his death Alexander took took over and while he had been trained um, for for many many years to to become king it, it you know he was a young man when he took over I believe he was 16 it could have been 18 I can't remember um, to be honest but he was a young man when he took over in uh, took over from his father so he hadn't and he did so. He didn't have a lot of experience, and there were a lot of, uh, you know, Macedonian uh, noble. I'll call them nobles, but you know, high-ranking officials and, and citizens within the Macedonian state that thought that they could sort of, uh, you know, carve their sphere of influence and, and gain influence with Alexander because he was such a young king. And after after consolidating everything, uh, Alexander wanted to prove that. Macedon was still one of the strongest uh, of the Greek nations, and the way he set out to do this um, was by looking uh, at, at t- t- looking for some military conquest. And the way he was doing that in terms of a military conquest um, was he looked obviously uh, he looked um, east towards the Parthians. Or sorry, the Persians. My my apologies, not the part. Uh, the east towards the Persians, who, um, who had land that uh, occupied Greeks were living on, uh, and Alexander sort of said, "All right, these are some, you know, there's some occupied Greeks over here. We're going to go and we're going to liberate them." And that was this first sort of Cassus Belli uh, for anyone who doesn't who isn't familiar with that term. Uh, basically, the Romans came up with this. Um, because of their system of laws, they needed a legal reason for going to war, um, rather than rather than just saying, "All right, we want what you have, and we want the la- or we want the land, or we want this, or whatever." We need a reason to actually go to war, uh, and they, the Romans were historically famous for framing all of their wars as defensive wars, or this was oh, this was done to us, so then. Um, 
will do something will do something in return for example uh, caesar uh you know caesar in gaul uh, had uh several instances where some minor they he used some minor slight as justification for uh going to going to war against the gauls but again we'll get to that later in the show in, in the series um Back to Alexander, so he thinks that okay, we're gonna. We're, he basically says, okay, we're gonna li- we're gonna liberate the the Greeks living under Ma- uh, under Persian rule. But the main thing was he wanted to prove that Macedon was still strong because under Philip II, going back to his father for just a second, the Macedonian army had been completely revamped, uh, and this uh, the famous phalanx uh, had been developed. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the phalanx was uh, basically a group of men. Uh, carrying extremely long uh, pikes or or spears, and they were able to uh, attack with greater range, and they were more a much more heavily armored infantry than any of the other uh, specifically Greek I- I- infantry of the time. Uh, the Greeks mostly preferring it more of a hoplite style. With a uh, yes, they had a spear, but they they were these were much more heavily inf- uh, armored and much more heavily outfitted. Uh, warriors, uh, and again, that those long pike-like spears uh, were able allowed them the greater reach and greater um, effect on the battlefield. Uh, they were able to attack the enemy long before the enemy was even get to getting uh, being able to get close to them. Uh, so the phalanx was massive in you know uh, maintaining uh, Macedonian power throughout Philip's reign. And uh, the other thing that he focused on was uh, the companion cavalry, and the companion cavalry were taken from—I'll call them the nobility, but the from the from the Macedonian nobility and high-ranking officials—and they weren't just nobles on horseback. These were basically the elite of the elite uh, soldiers. So they weren't just um, you know everyday soldiers. No everyday soldier could do this. They were base uh, you know consider them the first. Um, British SAS or U.S. Marine Corps. They were the elite of the elite in in Macedon um, in terms of how they were outfitted, in terms of their their armor, their weapons, and also their skill with with horses, with uh, skill uh, with uh, weapons or with the with the short spears that they carried. They were deadly accurate with those, and as well, of course, obviously their their skill with uh, with blade with blade weapons like uh, swords. Now. Philip revolutionized the army, making it a standing army, uh, which means they were actual soldiers that were employed rather than having um, just, you know, everyday farmers who, when the co- when the country was going to war or were attacked, would pick up a spear and be sort of lightly equipped. No, these were professional soldiers. Uh, so that, that, that was a big point of why they were able to um, you know, become so dominant in, in, in Greece. And Alexander wanted to continue that dominance and prove that, that he uh, d- was able to be dominant as well as his father was. And so he decided to go and invade uh, the Persians. Now, uh, Alexander, the first thing that he did upon arriving in, uh, arriving in Persia was realized that he only had a month's worth of pay and food uh, for his uh, for his uh, for his army. So he could only pay um, the army for a month. They managed to get forty seven thousand, roughly forty seven thousand troops uh, across the Hellespont River. Um, you know, uh, making you know into into Persia. Uh, but he only had enough money and food and and resources to to feed them and house them for a month. Um, so uh, he basically bankrupted the kingdom and bet everything in Macedon on this war. Um, and he was betting on himself. And this is, this is, uh, you know, this kind of, this kind of the, the, the first instance of how like daring and bold uh, and almost, in, in my personal opinion, almost stupid um, Alexander was initially, especially when he was young, he was rash and didn't really, um, wasn't really thinking it through in terms of his, um, in terms of his, in terms of his strategy and whatnot, um, because it doesn't make it doesn't make sense when you're when you don't have enough money to to fund this uh, to fund this campaign to to actually go and do it. 
it sort of seems w weird, at least uh, in my opinion, it, it certainly does. Um, but again, so he only had, um, you know, the, he only had one month uh, of resources to, to supply his war. And, and after that, the entire kingdom would become insolvent. So it wasn't just that the military budget would run out, like everything would be, he wouldn't be able to do, like his entire, the entire um, treasury of the kingdom would be uh, wiped out. So the first thing that they needed to do once they crossed into Persia was, you know, uh, capture a town or defeat uh, a Persian army relatively quickly. Um, so Alexander sort of rolls up with all this pomp and circumstance, and rolls up to one of the uh, one of the one of the main uh, cities with Greeks, uh, you know, that was under uh, occupied Persian rule, and goes, "Hey, I'm here to liberate you." Uh, he says he says to the, the the you know the Greeks in the in the city. Hey, I'm here to liberate you. And the Greeks look at him and go, uh, why? You know, we're extremely happy where we are. We're extremely happy uh, under Persian rule. The Persians have treated us well. They've allowed us to practice our, our religion and they've allowed us, they allow us to do whatever it is that we want to do. Um, so they're sort you know, we pay, obviously they, they had, uh, you know, so the, they, they, they go, no, we don't, we don't need liberating. We're not under persecution. We're not, you know, we're not being treated poorly, uh, at least not to the extent that they would demand that, you know, they live under Macedonian rule rather than Persian rule. So pretty much the war, this was pretty much the worst start that Alexander um, could have had for his for his conquest. Um, so, like, you know, he, he the entire um, almost per, like. You know, I'll say re the entire reason, or the entire justification, I should say, the entire justification for this war was now for nothing because he had, you know, he had framed it as, as we mentioned, he had framed this war as a, a war of liberation for Greeks in uh, Greeks in per, under Persian rule, and now the Greeks are saying, no, we like it here, we we're gonna stay, we're gonna, this is what we're gonna do. Um, so it's very, very interesting to see that. Um, now, while this is going on, so Alexander is marching around and, and there's a couple of towns that surrendered to him, some minor towns, undefended towns, but no big city surrendered to him. So he's still, you know, really tight on finances and resources and, you know, the army is struggling a bit. Um, now, the Persians, while this were happening, were, were convening a meeting. Um uh, and one of the people who was at this meeting was uh, Memnon, a person named Mem Memnon of Rhodes. Hmm. Excuse me. And Memnon of Rhodes was a, a Greek uh, mercenary who was fighting, who had uh, fighting for the Persians, and he had, um, and you know, he was a he was a great commander, and he was one of he was again he was the leader of a mercenary troop that was fighting under Persian. Uh, for, for Persian for Persian gold, uh, shall we say they per, they were under the employ of the Persians and you know the Persians are okay. What do we do? We've got this massive Greek army on our hands. Like, what? How do we handle this? Should we should should we you know should we attack them? Should what what do we do? Like, what do we do? You know, there this is a this is a really really bad uh, situation. Obviously, you've got forty seven thousand heavily armored, heavily armed, uh, you know, foreign nationals invading your country pretty bad for example if you know uh, uh, you know if you had you know 47,000 american troops crossing the border into canada or, or into mexico this would be a very very bad thing obviously that has hasn't happened at the time of recording and probably isn't going to happen but again y y you know the, the pol political leaders in 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 persia at the time were freaking out because you know they have this you know this um this like extremely large for its time uh you know greek army attacking them and memnon of rhodes is at this meeting and he says okay i know the macedonians i understand their not only their political situation but also their their financial situation and i know that they, they're a very small nation amongst the greeks and not necessarily extremely wealthy they were um you know they weren't extremely wealthy outside of Math. like they were they were well they were fine but they weren't one of the wealthier nations they weren't like athens or not, not even sparta or uh or uh, any any of that any of any of those nations whatsoever 
so th- he knew that uh, Alexander needed to, to do something quickly to uh, find resources and financial support for his war. Uh, and he, so Ma- uh, Memnon of Rhodes suggested this um, the, scor- the scorched earth tactics. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, a scorched earth uh, st- strategy is basically you burn all the farms, you burn... Uh, the land you salt the you know you you uh, you burn the farms you burn the land you burn the villages you evacuate everybody and you live to fight another day uh, strategy it's a very effective uh, strategy you know you can the argument is you can re sow crops you can rebuild your buildings but you can't uh, bring back people from the dead of course you know people are the most more valuable than property and you know it's better to protect your people than protect your land. You know, the scorched earth strategy is, is, is uh, one we'll get to a lot. And, and in fact, um, if you, some of you may have heard about the, uh, you know, the famous, uh, the Romans salted the ground of Carthage to make sure nothing would grow again. That's a very, uh, that's more of the offensive side of this tactic. Um, but the defensive side would be if uh, all the Carthaginians burned all of the crops so that the, the Roman or the invading army couldn't live off the land. So that's what the Memnon is suggesting for the, the uh, for the Persians is, okay, uh, I know that the, um, the Macedonians don't have a lot of money, don't have a lot of resources, don't have a lot of food to support the army. So if we pull back and we, you know, we burn our crops and we, we don't give them, we don't give them the ability to live off uh, what they, you know, what the land that they conquer, uh, whether that be they've conquered farms or cities or whatever, then they'll have to turn back in a month because they don't have enough money. And the Persian, the Persians go, uh, no. Well, you know, they, they're thinking, okay, here is this, we've got a Greek army that's coming and invading us. And then you have another Greek. Yes. One we're paying when we have some sort of a relationship with, but you have another Greek who's saying, Hey, burn all of your stuff and leave and give them the land. And the Persians didn't really like this. Understandably, uh, you know, they, they didn't really like this. Now, Memnon was, uh, you know, as, as we know from history, Memnon was right. Uh, this was a good strategy. He was correct. If the Persians had done this, obviously we don't know how that could have gone. That's, that's a thing for alternate history. But if the Persians had done this, it would have been the, like the smart, uh, unfortunately the unpopular, but the smart tactic uh, so Memnon did suggest, suggest suggest a good course of action here. Unfortunately, the Persians, and understandably, they didn't like that tactic. Obviously, this is these are their homes, these are their people, and this is their their property. And they're going, and you're telling them, ah, uh, no, just forfeit it to the Greeks because, you know, for for what they think is a a weak reason, you know, they thought that they could win, and they thought that they would be able to. They thought that they'd be able to destroy the Greeks. So instead of uh, taking Memnon of Rhodes' advice, they decide uh, they decide to sort of get an army together and then march to defeat uh, defeat the Greeks. Now, this took place in May of uh, 334 BCE. Um, and now that we've sort of set up the conditions for the battle, uh, let's get into sort of... Um, you know what's what happened. Um, so Alexander gets word uh, somehow. Uh, it's not really clear, probably from scouts or villages that he'd conquered, or people or merchants or whatever, um, that a, a Persian army is mass uh, massing near the Granicus River, and he goes, "All right, bet I'm going to attack you." So he marches his his army uh, to the Granicus River, uh, and. Uh, you know, both armies were relatively similar in size by this point. Uh, the, you know, the Macedonians had between you know forty and fifty thousand men, or you know roughly forty. I've said roughly forty-seven thousand. Uh, that is the number that a lot of ancient sources sort of come up with. Uh, it's a little foggy. Could have been forty-five. Could have been forty-eight. Doesn't. It's not. A, you know, they have roughly forty-five thousand, forty-seven thousand men. Uh, we have reliable numbers from later battles that we'll get into uh, in other episodes in this series. Um, but uh, and the and the mass uh, the Persians had about uh, you know thirty five thousand to the forty thousand men. Um, again, uh, again, it's not entirely a hundred percent clear. Uh, this was obviously a very long time ago, uh, but it's roughly about thirty five to forty thousand men. That's pretty much what you need to know. And um, 
the way the uh, the landscape um, is set up is, is a huge part of of this battle because the um, because the way that Alexander sets up his army is he has the companion cavalry that we've mentioned previously, the elite of the elite on the wings, and the uh, insanely he uh, heavy infantry for especially for the time period, uh, the heavy uh, phalanx uh, in the middle, sort of almost. Uh, so you've got infantry in the middle. And then you've got the the cavalry on the wings there, and uh, again, uh, this was a very standard setup for um, ancient battles and you know and even uh, medieval battles as well. Basically, pretty much right up until cavalry stopped becoming a thing uh, in the late uh, or early 1900s. Even World War One cavalry was being used. Obviously, it didn't go so well, um, but uh, you know the cavalry was used basically right up until the the late uh, the early 20th century so that's that's pretty uh you know so this is a pretty standard formation here and uh the persians do roughly the same thing except their infantry is a lot they're a lot more mobile a lot lighter infantry uh and but they're again in the middle and the, their their cavalry is on the wings memnon of rhodes is, is obviously uh he's still under uh persian employ so he's um you know he's he's at this battle and he's his his greek uh his greek mercenaries are also they're 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 infantry so they're in the middle um the landscape around the granicus river was not favorable for the the macedonians at all um as i mentioned the uh the phalanx was a extremely heavily armored heavy infantry for the time period um, especially in in Greece, where you know they were much more focused on on light infantry. You know, you had minimal armor, maybe a shield, uh, you know, a shield, cuirass, uh, greaves, and and uh, you know, a helmet, and maybe some van braces as well. Pretty much, that's it. Um, and so the phalanx, especially due to the nature of their f formation, were hard to maneuver, and it would be hard uh, to do uh, to do uh, you know to to get them moving through long grass and through mud and basically anything that wasn't an open field on a dry day they were it was more difficult for them as it would be for anybody but it was like they're because of the nature of their formation and their armor and their and their spears of course is more difficult for them because of and because of because of the conditions and those are the conditions that we find at the at the granicus river you know you've got the the muddy steep river banks you've got long grass it's not you know it's it's difficult for, it would be more difficult for them so uh Perminian, who is alexander's second and you know second in command pretty much says hey we've just been marching all day to meet to make it to the granicus river um why don't we uh you know, encamp for the night. The Persians might want to pull back, and then maybe we can cross the river in the morning. Um, you know, unencumbered by by battle, we can cross the river, then set up, and it might be a more favorable favorable position for us. And uh, again, it's not clear on the ancient sources aren't clear on whether or not um, Alexander straight out rejects this advice or if this advice was even given. But that's the way it's made to seem. Uh, and Alex Alexander goes, um, no. Um, we're not going to do that. You know, why would we, we've marched all day. Why would we let, you know, why would we, we've come all this way. Why would we let a tiny little river stop us is the, the, almost the direct quote there. Um, and he orders the phalanxes and his infantry to march, um, uh, which kicks off the battle. Um, so while the infantry is marching, um, Alexander takes command of one flank and Parminian takes command of the cavalry on the other flank. Um, and then Alexander, Alexander's cavalry charges, uh, across the river, but they don't charge directly at the enemy, uh, at the enemy cavalry straight across from the, across the river. They charge on a very steep, sharp angle, aiming directly for the center of the, um, center of the Persian army. Now, this is a... You know, again, I've used these words to describe Alexander before. Uh, bold, daring, again, possibly even downright stupid, um, possibly even downright stupid uh, move on my part. You know, you're charging directly into heavily fortified, you know, infantry that are waiting for you. They've got their, they've got spears. They're, you know, you know, you're 
horses are, you know, while you are a heavily armored cavalry and you're the best of the best and you're the elite, right? You're not, like, you're not invincible. Uh, and we'll get back, we'll get to this later in, in this in this series when we cover more of Alexander's, uh, more more things to do with Alexander and the, and the uh, Macedonians. But they weren't invincible. For, for By no means were they invincible whatsoever. And you have this, you know, this plucky young upstart of a king, um, you know, you've got this, this, he's young, almost, again, it's very, very, like, it, I don't know if it's arrogance or, or what, like, it seems very, 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 like, I feel like I'm, you've got, young, you know, young, per <coughs> excuse me, young person invincibility uh, here, and he thinks, I'm going to crush them, I'm going to win, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. Now, immediately, uh, obviously, the, um, the horses overtake the um, infantry because they're faster. No shit. Uh, they're, they're, they're faster. So Alexander finds himself and his cavalry directly in the middle of the battle. And when I started off this podcast, I talked about how... Um, I talked about how this is, like, one of the craziest uh, battles because the entire course of human history could have been altered... Uh, or at least in certainly, uh, you know, uh, Greek history and, and the way we, we, we look at Greek history could have been completely altered. And we and the way we look at Alexander uh, from Macedon could have been absolutely changed forever. Uh, and this is why, you know, he found himself surrounded by cavalry um, or his, found himself and his cavalry surrounded by infantry on all sides. They were boxed in. Um and they were, like, in the thick of the fighting. In fact, there are even reports that they weren't even charging. They were just standing there, hacking on their, like, on horseback, hacking and stabbing and almost w working like infantry, you know, knee to knee, side by side, in rows, fighting um, the infantry. And that, um, if you know anything about cavalry, that is not how they should be used. Uh... Cavalry are extremely effective at charges. You know, the, you know whether it's a whether it's a flat square line formation or if it's an angled formation or if it's a diamond formation. They are um, extremely, uh, you know, extremely good at charging into a stationary enemy. Unfortunately, because of the terrain surrounding the Granicus River, they weren't able to build up their speed. They had to come up the river slowly. They sort of broke formation a little bit, so it it they got bogged down by the natural elements. Now, just for a second, as an example of what a good cavalry charge looks like, although this is more of a visual, uh, this and again, this isn't a historically accurate one. The um, Charge of the Rohirrim for the, from the Battle of Pelennor Fields in The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, if any of you have seen that movie. If you haven't seen Lord of the Rings, go watch it. Highly recommend. Uh, not sponsored, obviously, but dude, go check it out. It's freaking dope. Uh, you know, they absolutely massacre the orcs who are who vastly outnumber them because they're charging down a hill. The land is flat. They're able to build up speed, and the orcs are standing still, and they don't have a lot of pikes or defensive positions, at least not um, aimed that, at that side. Now, that's what cavalry are supposed to be used for, smashing into a stationary infantry force, not what Alexander did. Uh, and, and part of what happened here, um, the reason this battle was, was so crazy is because Alexander was nearly killed three, three times. He was, um, and you could say, you know, uh, you could say, well, it's it's dangerous for any king and any noble ever to be involved in the fighting, and he could have died. You, you're you're at war. There's death all around you. You could have died. You could have, like, he was reckless and could have died. Like, it wasn't just okay. His army lost and everyone was defeated, and then he was you know killed. It was or imprisoned. It was he could have died because of his own recklessness, not necessarily because of you know his because of defeat or whatever. Um, he was very, very, very lucky in this battle. And that's something that, uh, you know, is sort of a theme throughout all of his, uh, all of his military conquests. And, you know, we should, I, in my, there's a, there's a, I have slightly of a, an opinion that maybe part of his greatness is due to his luck, uh, the, how lucky he was. Uh, in fact, at one point he, his, uh, 
his spear broke off, like the tip of his spear broke off. And um, so he was just standing there with, a, you know, a, a, and he had to grab a new one from a bodyguard. And then that, er, one of his spears broke, sorry, and he had to grab a new one from a bodyguard. Okay, that happens, whatever, that happens in battle. Spears break, weapons fail, whatever. There's one time where he's facing off against um, a, a Persian military commander who is then um, attacking, attacking, and uh, he stabs him, but the spear point breaks off, so he's just standing there holding a big stick, and the guy's about to come in and swing and kill him with his sword, but he, um, but but Alexander thrusts one more time with the broken spear, and it knocks him from the horse. Um, obviously, this particular, um, this particular, uh, particular dude wasn't exactly, um, you know, wasn't exactly, uh, you know, very skilled, but he was able to, obviously he wasn't killed by that, and he it comes at Alexander again. Alexander is able to kill him, um... There was one time where he was rescued by uh, one of his one of his subordinates named Cletus the Black, which fantastic name by the way. Uh, Cletus the Black is an absolute G saves Alexander. Uh, and there's another time um, where Alexander is uh, knocked off his horse because uh, he's fighting he's fighting one on one with somebody and a uh, Persian cavalry soldier sneaks up on him and clangs him in the back of the head cleaves straight through his helmet and bites into Alexander's skull with his sword, which is nuts. Holy cow, this is ridiculous. Like, he almost, he could have, like, you know, inches more, and he would have gone through brain matter, he would have killed him, and the the Macedonian king, you know, would have been screwed, uh, dead, and, the, you know, the Persians would have won the battle. Um, luckily, Alexander is, you know, able to fight him off and kill him. Um, and there's another time where he's about to... Uh, He's about to, uh, you know, be killed, but um, one of his bodyguards chops off the dude's arm, and then Alexander is able to kill him again. So again, he's extremely lucky. If, if a couple of things had gone differently for him, he probably would have been uh, skewered in like the first five minutes of battle. And you know, it almost doesn't seem realistic. It almost seems like it was written by some sort of like fantasy novel or uh, fantasy novel writer or something like some sort of novel writer where the main Alexander is the main character, and the main character can't die because plot armor. Right or you know how in movies you are often like why does this happen and why doesn't you know this per well you know sometimes like one person will get shot in a movie or in a show and it'll you know graze the shoulder and they'll be fine and then the, you know when you want the character to be killed off they'll shoot in the same spot but it'll kill them or something you know it, it seems like it almost seems like that like Alexander had some sort of like divine plot armor and was like you're not gonna die you're not allowed to die. Uh, and again, we'll get into this later in the series when we talk more about Alexander, but it almost feels like he, um, you know, almost felt like he could have died several times. Um, obviously, the battle, obviously he didn't die, and the battle sort of continues, and then the uh, Macedonian infantry joins the battle, um, and once they're engaged with the, the Persian infantry, um, you know, it... It basically spelt spelt the end of the end of the battle because, uh, the, you know, the Macedonian infantry are that much more powerful. They're that much better. Mm, excuse me. They're that much like again. They've they've just under sheer force and sheer weight of their their heavy infantry. Once they were able to get moving, they were very very hard to stop. Uh, so again, a lot of the Persians uh, are scared and they they flee. And Memnon and Rhodes is, is there again. He's fighting, and he's you know it it, it it doesn't look good for the Persians. And the basically the writing's on the wall at that point. The battle is pretty much over. And and Parmenian um, has um, defeat. Uh, you know ch again, Ale uh, Parmenian charges in uh, with a cavalry charge and sort of again comes in from the side and does what cavalry is supposed to do and wipes out more of the infantry. Uh, and the Persians are and the Persians are rattled and scattered. Alexander is somehow again thrown from his horse, but uh, <clears throat> excuse me, manages to uh, sort of you know manages to uh, stay alive. And is uh, at one point he's you know dragged from the battle, 
uh, and just like the, his bodyguards were just like, dude, you gotta you gotta chill for a second because you, you know you're, you're making our you know we're supposed to protect you, but you know this this job is uh, I like my job and I can't do my job if you're dead and I will get fired and you know things just not a good look if the the king is dead even if you win the battle it's not a good look if the king dies so he has to take a step back and the Macedonians eventually win the day and to me this is one of the craziest um, things because again you know throughout throughout history there were certain names that people just know right whether you study history or, or you follow you follow it or it's an interest of yours or not you've probably like you could probably go up to anyone on the street although with covid don't uh you know social distance wear masks get vaccinated if you're not vaccinated um but like you could probably could ask anybody on the street do you know who alexander the great is and they go yeah he's some sort of greek king of something like you know what i mean they'll, they'll know his name they'll recognize the name even you know even if they don't follow history for example you know a lot of people will recognize Julius Caesar's name or Henry VIII or, you know, some other great, you know, Augustus, the first emperor of Rome or, you know, uh, Cleopatra or whatever it is. People will know that the names that have survived through history just because of the fact that these, these people accomplished, you know, great things or they were part of nations that accomplished great things and their names survive because of that. You know, um, you take any uh, ancient history class, you're going to study Julius Caesar or, you you know, you know, you've even got the Shakespeare play where he wrote an entire play about Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar's not really in the play, but he's doing a whole lot of stuff behind the scenes. The whole play is about what he's doing and what the, the people's reactions to it. Um, you know, it's it's very much one of those things. Uh, you know, Alexander is very much one of those names. You know, he's one of those people that everybody sort of knows. And if this battle had gone differently, obviously, if this battle had gone differently and, and the Macedonians had lost, um, that would have been obviously that could have been different. And Alexander wouldn't be have given the the name. Ale he wouldn't have been given the epithet Alexander the Great. Um, but it's more than that. It's not just that he lost because maybe or if, you know, not just like, not just if they lost, um, if the Macedonians had won the battle, but Alexander had died at any of the points that he was almost killed. Right. And it's, it's different, uh, than most other times, you know, Julius Caesar, you know, you, you hear him and I'm comparing them because they're both, you know, considered two of the greatest military commanders throughout, uh, ancient, the ancient. Uh, history. We'll get to the Caesar and the Romans uh, again on a different podcast, but um, they're both like excellent military commanders uh, throughout history, especially the ancient world. And you know, you never hear about Julius Caesar putting himself in extreme danger, except when it's you know necessary or it's like his army is overrun in certain areas and he's you know dragging people. And he's, you know, fighting and he's fighting in the front lines and he's, like, you know, galvanizing the troops. And it is important to see the king, like, you know, it is important to see the king fighting rather than standing off on a ridge and not fighting. And, you know, and I think that that's a big, you know, boost for the Macedonian troops, at least not just not just at the Battle of the Granicus River, but in others in other uh, scenarios as well that we'll get to. But again, Alexander's recklessness almost cost him his 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 well call it an empire right almost cost him macedon he would have you know if he was if he wasn't as lucky as he was and his recklessness hadn't sort of paid off uh at the battle of grand river he would have lost uh he would have not just lost he would have died uh you know and he probably you know by all rights should have died uh especially when his helmet was cleaved into and the the sword you know sort of just glanced and just grazed the back of his skull. If that sword had bitten deep into his skull, he would have been killed. And again, we don't know what could have happened, but regardless of how good the Macedonian military was, they could have, uh, it could have been seriously awful. They could have, they could have lost. And then again, their entire justification for the war uh, that we got to at the beginning of this podcast uh, was about liberate, uh, liberating the Persians. And that was Alexander's, uh, you know, that was Alexander's uh, sort of justification, not just the the Macedonian justification. Like he wanted to, he wanted to do the war uh, to to you know initiate war with the Persians. Not just uh, Macedon did. You know he wasn't like there was pushback uh, initially for this for this effort, especially because 
you know, the Macedonian uh, nation was uh, pretty much bankrupt after he funded this after he funded this war. Um, so if things had gone even slightly different for Alexander, if he'd been, you know, there were three or four examples that we listed there that, you know, he could have died at any of those times and it would have been, you know, in fact, there's one that I didn't mention where uh, there's a, you know, he's, there's a spear that's thrown at him and he just manages to catch it with the end of his shield before he, before he, uh, you know, before it, before it, it killed him. And it was, it, you know, it's, I mean, there's plenty of instances like that where, yes, obviously it, it's battle, it's dangerous, it's crazy, it, you know, things happen, you know, it, you're, you're going to war, you're trying to fight, you're trying to kill other people who are trying to kill you, you know what I mean? It, there is inherent risk involved, but it's Alexander took extra risk that he didn't need it need to take, um, and that's why I wanted to focus on this for my first episode because if we're if we're going to talk about ancient history and this is basically and this is what this podcast is I, like I said we're going to start with ancient history uh, moments start ancient history and we're kind of going to jump all over the place a little bit at least to start uh, to see what people like uh, and and then we're gonna. Um, sort of narrow down and, and focus more coherently on things. Um, but initially, but again, uh, if you're going to talk about ancient history, you can't not talk about Alexander the Great and the Macedonians at some point. It's just, you know, it's an important part of ancient history. And, you know, if things had gone differently for Alex, Alexander here, it could have been really bad, and he probably would have been one of those names that's lost to history rather than one of the most premier names throughout ancient history and uh, to come out of the ancient world. Anyway, uh, thank you all for listening, and I hope you really enjoyed the, this first episode of Navigating History. Um, don't really have a set schedule for when the next episode is going to be out, uh, um, but it could be, you know, sometime. it should be roughly one episode per week uh, uploaded at some point. My... Uh, my schedule is a little bit up in the air at the moment, so it could be, um, you know, next Monday, could be next Friday, could be whenever. It doesn't really uh, matter. But I really ho- I th- want to thank anyone who's uh, anyone who's taken the time to listen to this. It's, it's my first episode, first ever thing I'm doing like this. So uh, please be patient with me if the audio quality isn't the best, or uh, you know, I'm sort of mumbling a little bit. This is my first ever podcast, so. Uh, please um, be uh, be patient with me, and uh, I'm really glad that if anyone took the time to listen, and if no one took the time to listen, and I'm talking to absolutely no one at the moment, then uh, that's okay too. So thank you for tuning in, uh, and I hope to uh, see you guys soon. Uh, bye for now.